Uh, so I will start by saying that by no stretch of the imagination can we ever say that we exist in discrete, isolated, separate entities. We don't, and we have never done that. As Arabs, as the world, as civilizations, whatever, historically, we are living in an interactive world. Our region in particular, and we're talking about the Arab world and the region, uh, and Palestine, of course, since I'm from there, we are the products of multiple, multiple forces and multiple processes. We did not emerge in isolation or fully formed from Zeus's head or something. We are part of an evolutionary interactive process in which different, different forces played major roles in shaping our history, our identity, and our future. And we can say, of course, uh, uh, that we are the products of uh, contemporary states are the products of a colonial system, of the will of other people who shaped us and our boundaries and so on. Uh, that's one, uh, one way of looking at it. But since we said the world is always interactive, we know that the 20th century harbored a new phase in interactivity, which is, which is characterized by the acceleration and compression of time. Hmm? Cyberspace is certainly very expansive and allows for rapid interaction and uh, transmot transformative forces that are crucial and change that takes place at a rapid, rapid pace at a point in which sometimes we do not have the time to reflect on it or absorb it or even initiate it consciously. Sometimes we enter into reactive rather than active moods. Uh, and of course, uh, the social media, I believe they are interactive. Yes, they are for communication, as you said, uh, Ibrahim, but also they are shapers. They are forces of democracy. They uh, also expose facts and realities that had uh, hitherto lain hidden, uh, and therefore they are forces of transformation, mobilization, and now they are tools that are used by, for example, in Syria, where the press isn't there. You didn't talk about Syria. I don't know whether it's on purpose or not, but the absence of the press made the, the social media, YouTube and, and Twitter and, and uh, uh, Facebook and so on, a source of information that is being picked up by international uh, agencies uh, and being displayed on television instead of the classical, and this is another the discussion I would like to have with you, instead of the classical mainstream media. So, and yes, of course, uh, we can say that uh, uh, the people who were active on Facebook and so on mobilized through that were not the ones who won elections, but that's for a variety of reasons. But they used these social media to mobilize and to carry out uh, the type of street action and popular resistance and revolution and so on. Intifada, something which we didn't have in the first Intifada, but we can talk about that. The reason for the Islamist uh, uh, power is a result of their own organization on the ground. And again, I'll address that later. And their own space within the conscience and consciousness of different societies, especially when they were excluded from the political system. Now, the impact of external forces are always, as I said, transformative, but they are not always positive and they are not always negative. Huh? Uh, uh, they can trigger or shape change, but they can also undermine constructive change particularly if they impact the credibility and integrity of this change. Now, some deliberate, overt, or conscious or premeditated intervention or interference often has, as Rima said this morning, often has a negative impact when it is deliberate and when it's planned and premeditated because there's a hidden agenda behind it, actually, and people are motivated by, of course, self-interest. Uh, while there are other forms of uh, forces, external forces, what some people call organic or natural forces, uh, that involve inevitable exposure, forces of ideas, some people call them forces of history, issues of development, issues of education, but primarily issues of human rights. These are issues that are available and that are there, and you cannot avoid and you have to uh, absorb or deal with. 
uh, as I said earlier, conscious intervention, particularly of a military type, has never been, or rarely, I don't say never, benign, altruistic, or idealistic. And therefore, the outcome of such military or violent interventions uh, is generally detrimental to the intrinsic realities on the ground, generally, because they assume the, the uh, logic of power and not of empowerment, always. Now, as uh, this is opposed to universal values and principles, particularly related to human rights and freedoms, to human dignity, uh, because there is such a thing as positive universality. I'm dating back, I don't want to go back to the Greeks and the Romans and the universal versus the specific and the common versus the unique, but certainly there is something in common, something universal. And it was, I called it the first global cry when we talked about the uh, universality of human rights, way before we talked about economic interdependence and activity. So, Again, what's happening in the Arab world is, in a way, debunking many myths. But the main myth that is being debunked is the excuse used by the traditional regimes that human rights are culture-specific. Culture uh, I don't know who said that. You said that. Uh, but somebody did mention it this morning. They've always managed to say, well, human rights violate our traditions. They are not within Arab culture. They violate our religion. Excuse me. I mean, all religions, if you look at them from a human and, and analytical, analytical point of view, advocate human rights. And there are systems of values that are common to humanity, and there are rights and freedoms that are common to all humanity. So the excuse to suspend human rights and democracy and values was a very convenient excuse used by the autocratic regimes, totalitarian regimes, to avoid dealing with these issues and to avoid accountability primarily, just in the same way, and I'll get to this later, that they use the Palestinian question to avoid democracy and human rights and reform. Uh, of course, they also debunked other myths, and this is, by the way, that the Arab world is not ready for democracy or that the Arabs are genetically violent or the Arabs are, gen gen are born missing the democratic gene. We hear this a lot especially under Israeli occupation, because the Israelis keep telling us the Arabs understand only violence. The Arabs understand only systems of control and power, and so on, and so on, and so on. This certainly has exposed the fact that Israel is living in never-never land, is attempting to hold back development, and is still using obsolete systems of power and control in order to maintain control over the Palestinians and, of course, hegemony over the region. And again, that's something I would like to explore later. Now, uh, there are, of course, now available to all of us, which is something positive, global instruments uh, that constitute an encroachment on traditional issues of sovereignty, for example. Before, any time you wanted to hold any regime accountable, they would say this is a question of sovereignty. Remember how many hundreds of thousands of Algerians died and we were told, you cannot talk about this because this is a violation of Algerian sovereignty. So now we have the issue of human security. Huh? Human security places value in the individual, and therefore you can engage, intervene to protect the individual, even from his or her own autocratic system. How far do we take that? How do you redefine sovereignty, of course? This, again, is another philosophical argument, if you wish to <laughs> address, which will take ages for us to, to look into. But I believe at least stretching the limits of sovereignty would stretch the limits of control over the human beings and the resources, the territory, and so on. And it's very important to be able to engage in favor of the voiceless or in favor of the excluded or the silenced and so on in ways that are effective. Uh, and this can be done, of course, without having a political agenda. That's why I'm very suspect when governments decide, huh? Uh -huh. now I want to come to the rescue of this individual or that group in this country. I would much rather see international multilateral organizations that we'll talk about later that uh, come to the rescue of these individuals rather than people with political agendas. Uh, these multilateral bodies and venues, of course, may be weak or lacking in enforcement and in possibility, 
We keep talking in Palestine about the Fourth Geneva Convention, the high contracting parties of the Fourth Geneva Convention, but they never meet. And when they meet, they discuss the applicability of the Fourth Geneva Convention and international humanitarian law to the Palestinians, but they never discuss enforcement or enforceability of the Fourth Geneva Convention to protect us. Precisely, there are other uh, reasons for that, since there, are, there is superpower manipulation at work here, constantly. Huh? We saw that even when 182 countries recently voted in favor of Palestinian self-determination, the U.S. decided to vote against its own principles and the U.N. Charter and, and so on and so on by voting against our right to self-determination. Of course, the Canada followed suit these days, along with Micronesia and Marshall Islands. So we are <laughs> – yeah, people say that's how you encourage tourism. People ask, where is Micronesia? So they have to go and – and, of course, they, they exhibit bias. There is no uniform standard when we talk about human rights instruments and human rights bodies and so on and global organizations because the power politics have come to play a major role. And that's why when people talk about, and you talked about this this morning, this, uh, uh, who was it? I think it was the Turkish minister, uh, Mr. David Og Oglu, who talked about the uh, the fact that there are multiple, not just double standards when it comes to values, human rights and human values and so on. And Israel is a supreme example here. Above the law, beyond accountability, and at the other end of the spectrum, the Palestinians are excluded from the protection of the law, and they certainly uh, are not protected uh, by it. Now, Different arenas, I don't want to go into that. We've discussed some of them. How do you intervene? How do you engage? How do you interfere? Whether it's economically or politically or militarily or in terms of social norms and uh, social justice and uh, governance. Whatever form of intervention there is, is a means to an end. Now, how you define the intervention is defined by the end. What do you want from it? Not justified, but defined, okay? What do you want from this intervention? That's how we measure it. Now, most of the Arab Spring or Arab Awakening revolutions, we call them intifadas because we felt very nostalgic about our original intifada, and we felt that this is a continuum, uh, the Palestinian intifada and the Arab Spring intifadas, that they are motivated by the same values and, and principles and, and yearning for freedom. But most of these intifadas or, or revolutions are saying we want, we don't want any foreign intervention, right? Nobody wants foreign inter intervention because that affects the integrity and the standing of your own revolution. Is it homegrown and so on, or is it externally defined and imposed? But, and they don't want military intervention because that very clearly smacks of colonialism and post-neocolonial colonialism and everybody is worried about resuscitating that era in which the, the Arab, uh, not just individual countries and the Arab faith was uh, a free for all, determined by everybody else but not by the Arabs. So they say no to foreign intervention but yes to protection. Notice now in Syria and I'm using that because it's still in the process. Yes to protection. We are calling for protection support. And in, in post-revolution or in transitional uh, phases, people are asking for support in institution building, in economic development. People are looking towards multilateralism, and some people talk about internationalization, not in the negative sense, but in the sense that it's the international community that has a responsibility to ensure that this transition is not tampered with or does not fall apart, that there are international instruments huh? and multilateral organizations that can help. This is important. Look, when they sent Ba'athet uh, Muraqibin, the Arab, and here we're talking about Arab regional as opposed to international, Ba'athet Muraqibin, a, a commission of observers to Syria. We all laughed, huh? regardless. I'm so, excuse me if there's anybody from the Arab League here. But we've seen that before. I remember in 96, I don't know if you remember, Hani, when we asked for international protection, they said, okay, we'll send you a presence, international presence for Hebron. And they call it temporary international presence in Hebron, TIF. Hmm? 
T-I-P-H, we call the TIF, yes. And I said, this sounds like you're sending us a ghost, an apparition, a presence, you know. And they were there. They're still there, the poor guys, from all over the world. They're sitting there in Hebron, being given the Palestinian treatment, being shot at, imprisoned, beaten up. Huh? And during curfew, they're, they're in their homes, they are unable. And what do they do? They sit down and write reports to their governments. That's it. Some are listened to, some are not, but they are not a force. They are a sop to their conscience that we did something. There is international presence, but it is absolutely useless. Huh? The media can be more interventive in shaping things than this presence. So if you want to do something, do it well or don't do it at all, because you pay a heavy price for it. Now, all transitions are vulnerable, and all transitions are precarious and in need of validation, empowerment, integrity, and support. And this is the role of people who share these values, aspirations, and principles to validate this transition, to ensure that it does not collapse, to make sure that the vulnerable are not, uh, the vulnerability is not exploited, and to move ahead. Now, uh, I don't talk about foreign intervention, but let's go back to Palestine as a glaring case of interventionism. We have multiple interventions, some positive, some negative. First, the most glaring is the military occupation. This is not intervention, this is enslavement. It is military enslavement. We have no rights, no freedoms whatsoever. In this modern day and age, there is a military power that is enslaving a whole nation. They're stealing our land, they're stealing our resources, they're stealing our homes, they are killing people, they're stealing our culture, they're stealing our history. What Ilan Pape calls the displacement replacement paradigm. And it is taking place in front of everybody's eyes. The whole world is watching while Palestine is being displaced and replaced by Israel. The names of our streets are changed. The names of our villages and towns are being changed. The old city of Jerusalem, you can barely recognize it now. They've put in between one quarter and another an Israeli settlement, and inside quarters Israeli settlements, and multiple cities. I don't want to go through that, but this is the most pervasive and cruel form of enslavement I have ever seen, I think, in, in history. Because they can easily kick you out as ethnic cleansing taking place, take away your home, they can easily rezone you, they steal your land and build apartheid roads for Jews only on your own land, and you can't move. You can't move even within the West Bank. So they're busy destroying the very foundation of peace, and nobody is saying anything on that. And when Obama talked about the Arab Spring, what did he say? Every Arab individual has the right to freedom, dignity, and self-determination. Now, having done that, having said that, then he moved to peace in the Middle East, where he continued to express full support for Israeli security, totally decontextualized the Palestinian people and the Palestinian cause, as if we are not part of the Arab Spring, as if we do not deserve those values and rights that the U.S. now is very much advocating for every Arab individual. They want to be part of the Arab Spring. Aha, uh -huh. excuse me, the key to the Arab Spring is justice to the Palestinians. This to me is the real thing. We, we refuse to be decontextualized. We refuse to be isolated. When people tell me, well, you know, the people of Libya or Tunisia or Egypt are not worried about I said, no, they are. Many of them tell me we want to put our house in order so we can liberate Palestine. A great deal of the injustice, of the lack of credibility and trust of the previous regimes was their hopelessness and helplessness before the ongoing injustice done to the Palestinian people, as well as some of them their collusion with the Israeli occupation. So it is time that we put the Arab house in order, and it can only serve the Palestinian cause and the Arab cause well. And that's the kind of intervention we need, frankly speaking, also as Palestinians. So, um, again, as, as Palestine, we've always said we need international law, international legality. That's our anchor, the international community, and so on. 
And it seems like, you know, children cry, crying in the wilderness because the international community doesn't want us <laughs> and international law doesn't apply to us. And we keep saying, that's, we need that, that's our anchor. And yet, when it comes to us, the whole region, not just Palestine, the whole region is being viewed through the prism of Israeli priorities, security, and interest. The whole region, let's not kid ourselves. They may give you lip service, huh? But what do they care about in Egypt? Are you going to adhere to the signed agreement or not? And when they said we will look into it and see where Israel has not fulfilled its obligations and we will act accordingly, all hell broke loose. You're going to violate agreements. No, we're not. We're going to look into them and see where Israel should be held accountable for violating them itself and we will act accordingly in order to rectify this non-compliance. This shows will. The, the West is used to the Arab world not having political will or, frankly speaking, the guts to stand up to Israel and American pressure. I can understand how the U.S. totally succumbed to Israel and followed by the quartet, which is a strange creature anyway, totally succumbed to Israel. But the Arab world, this is the beginning of the emergence of not just a political will, but a determination to make a difference. And we should and we can make a difference. We also oscillated, excuse me, between what we call the independence of the Palestinian decision-making and Arab that al-umq al-Arabi al-istiqlalit al-qarar al-Palestini, right? Remember? And it took a while before istiqlalit al-qarar al-Palestini, the independence of Arab decision, of Palestinian decision, is not drawing away from the Arabs, but rather drawing away from the manipulation of the Arab regimes of the use of the Palestinian question for their own narrow self-interest. Part of which is, again, lack of accountability, lack of human rights, lack of democracy, because they have an important external military security threat. Hmm? They're all busy wasting resources, oppressing their people because they're defending them against an external threat. Huh? Why? <laughs> yeah, while the Palestinians in this, at the same time were not in any way given the real support to be able to stand up to the uh, Israeli occupation. Now we're saying Al-Umq al-Arabi is different from overt or manipulative interaction. Al-Umq al-Arabi is a necessary, a necessary interactive cooperative uh, approach uh, for several reasons. One, and this applies to Palestine and the region. We need to level the playing field because the playing field has always been biased. It has always been uneven for the Palestinians and for the region. Two, we need to ensure there's a global rule of law which is even also. Nobody with a sense of entitlement, exceptionalism, preferential treatment like Israel and others outside it. Uh, with the exception also of human rights and values, as I said, there is no prescriptive one-size-fits-all approach particularly when it comes to the Bretton Woods uh, institutions. You asked me to talk about those, but I think other economists can do that. Uh, you have to have the solution emanate from the situation. When we compare state and non-state actors, certainly the non-state actors are better equipped to make a difference, precisely because they don't have a political agenda and they are less suspect, even though some of them may be carrying out a political agenda, especially if they are from uh, national uh, sources. What non-state actors can do is assist in establishing procedural, structural, and legal foundations. You talked about the judiciary, but we assist, not establish themselves, but assist in establishing them for the transition to democracy to ensure all those values of inclusion, transparency, social justice, and equity. They must support homegrown initiative. You cannot come with your own views. When we started our reform plan, we started it in the 90s. The first corruption report was in 96, right? 90, yeah, right, 96. And we moved from there in Palestine. We didn't wait for Bush and, and the rise to tell us as a broader Middle East and the greater Middle East and reform is something you must do. We've done it ourselves. It was homegrown. And that's how it should be. The agenda, you should own the agenda, as somebody said this morning. And we must engage regional players who had undergone similar experiences because we do not need to go all over the world to learn from their experiences because there are, in the region, 
people who share a culture and a history and a language and who've been through these. For example, we have a coalition for accountability and integrity called AMAN that has been very instrumental in working within the regional Arab context. The same thing as our human rights ombudsman. Transfer of knowledge and experience is important for decentralization and networking. We need to support the momentum and the consolidation of change in order to avoid regression, and or not just regression, but a reversal. And this is, there is still a possibility of reversal. We can't take these things for granted, which gets us to behavioral patterns. I believe you have to change realities on the ground, behavior changes, but you cannot wait till behavior changes in order to create new institutions, especially when you are undergoing a violent transition. For example, in our reconciliation talks, we are talking about human rights, we are talking about freedoms because you don't want the, the sense of revenge to take over, huh? but you want to be able to um, deal with the trauma and with the results of violence uh, on the ground. And of course, prevent the politicization of external actors, whether they're human rights or others. Um, there are two extremes now, I know I'm, I have too many, I'm, I'll just try to say them very quickly, two extremes. The dissolution of central authority, which is what happened in, in Iraq, for example, as a result of the most overt form of intervention, which is war, uh, they dissolve the central authority. What do you have? You have a vacuum. You have a crumbling of all the institutions. You need to work with civil society to fill this vacuum. You need to be able to have organizations and so on, voluntary groups, to be able to uh, deal with the vacuum that the crumbling power systems have left behind and they're important, but also you need to make sure the other extreme doesn't happen, where you can remove the symbol of uh, an autocratic system, but you leave the systems of power in place. And this is where one has to be very careful, because it's not just one or two, but the inability to dislodge systems of power that may result in future inequities, they tend to magnify in the, in the future, and that has to be dealt with also. Again, the question of identity, of culture, of ethnicity, of sectarianism. We need to be able to get to a, a, a situation of validation without disintegration. We need to be able to move with managing diversity and pluralism through inclusion. Exclusion is what creates a sense of injustice and therefore violence. And uh, of course, we the participation uh, of previously excluded forces has to be ensured while avoiding extreme reactive modes. And the challenges of not just mobilization, but as we said earlier, organization. It is very easy to mobilize, to incite people to act. It is very difficult to organize on the ground. And this is the difference between traditional Islamist political parties and between the rise of the young and the new and the you know, cyberspace savvy generation, if they cannot organize on the ground and build political parties and challenge through the ballot box, they will not get there. And this is something they have to learn how to do, using different means um, at their the disposal. And of course, we need to ensure that women and youth, through affirmative action, receive the support and reinforcement that they need. We learned a lot and we benefited from the Tunisian legislative experience, for example, and the experience of women everywhere. If you read the Egyptian women's experience dating back to the 19th and early 20th century, they were pioneers. So we have to be able to ensure that we have networks and, and support systems that are mutually enforceable, and we must make sure that we do not replace authoritarian, dictatorial, oppressive systems with other absolutist and closed systems. Nobody has a monopoly on the truth or on God. Thank you. Thank you.